Now I'll show you the best way to graph these. Okay, so here we have the glucose and in the end, because it was a release of energy, potential energy, because it's bond energy, so we graph this as potential energy, and we always write down the unit in kilojoules, versus, well, whatever the time is here, we just call it reaction coordinate, that's okay. The lower amount of energy actually belongs to the products here. And so in an exothermic reaction, the products always have less heat content than the reactant does because this thing turned into this and it released heat. So we have less energy in the products than the reactants. But in order to connect this line we need to do something a little more special. We need to remind ourselves that energy first had to be added in order to form C and H and O atoms because we needed to take this chemical and break it down into all of those individual atoms before they could rearrange to form all of these, these molecules as products. And so, we needed to add a certain amount of energy to get to this thing called the activated complex. So we needed to add an activation energy. Yeah, you see, the activation energy. So, that's called the EA right there, the activation energy. And then the reaction release it. Well, I hope that you got to straighten that out a little bit. <laughs> the reaction then releases heat to form these products. And so we have energy that's released here, energy that's absorbed here, but the difference between the two, that is always your delta H. And the delta H here, of course, was negative 68 kilojoules. And so that is always, and the delta H is always the difference between where you start and where you stop. But in between, we have a little bit of an activated complex that we have to take into account. Now, in that endothermic reaction, the products end up with more potential energy than the reactants had. Remember, this has to gain 241.8 kilojoules to turn into that. So we have a higher enthalpy for the products than we do for the reactants in an endothermic reaction. Okay, but still we need to draw the graph properly because we have to add energy in to break bonds and energy is released when bonds form. So we go up to here and we write down the H uh, and O atoms. This is your activated complex again, right? We had to add activation energy to get to that point. Now energy is going to be released as well. So even in reactions that are endothermic, energy is still released. But the net amount of energy difference here is a gain in energy between here and here, from where you start to where you stop. And of course that's called the delta H, the change in energy, which in this case is 241.8 kilojoules to the good. So that's positive. Okay, and that's how you do an endothermic graph. shortcut method for Hess's law really can only be done if you know what the heats of formation are for every compound in the equation. Okay, so somebody says to you, hey, here's a reaction. Uh, it's a combustion of methane, but the problem is that I don't know the delta H. Can you find it for me? And you say, yeah, yeah, give me those equations to add together. I'll, I'll manipulate them. And you, you, no, you're not given those equations. So then what are you going to do? Well, you find a chart that has heats of formation on them, and you take the sum of the heats of formation of the products and you subtract the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. And what you're basically doing there is then taking what are the heats of formation of these compounds, because they are forming, and you are taking away from them the heats of formation here because these chemicals really aren't forming. They're decomposing. So really this formula is it's the heats of decomposition plus the heats of formation and that of course gives you the change in the heat. So take a formation chart and subtract heats of formation of the reactants from the products and that will give you the delta H. Here's how you do it. So you take the heats of formation of the products and subtract them from the reactants. So, the delta H equals 
one mole of CO2, because there's one mole of CO2 there, times the heat of formation of CO2, which is negative 393.5. Because that's how much energy is released when one mole of CO2 forms from its elements. And one mole is forming, so therefore I'm writing one mole times negative 393.5 over one mole CO2. Now look at it, I'm doing proper unit cancellation, and you gotta do that. If you're writing a written response test, you have to do all of this unit cancellation to get the answer right. Look, if you're doing multiple choice, find the answer, okay? But, in this case, I'm showing you how to do it right, so you'll get the great marks, eh? So, there's your cancellation there of the CO2. And you're going to add that to the heat of formation of 2 moles of H2O. 2 moles times negative 241.8 kilojoules per 1 mole. So that cancels out that, 2 times that, plus that. Subtract from it the heats of formation of the methane. But where's the oxygen? Elements don't have heats of formation. Their standard heats of formation for any element in its natural state is zero. What's the natural state for, pho for phosphorus? P4. So that would be zero. What about sulfur? S8. Zero. What about N2, O2, H2, zinc? They're all zero. So, you take the heat of formation of the products minus the heat of formation of that one mole of reactant. There's its heat of formation there. Per mole, it's on any kind of chart. In Alberta, the data booklet page number is number 6 and 7. And you will, when you add those together and subtract this, you get negative 802.5. And what is that? That's the delta H for this reaction. And again, that's the net amount of heat released. The total amount of heat released in this reaction that we can see is actually these numbers here. But we had to take away how much heat we needed to add to break down the CH4 to get the delta H or the change in the heat. Next question.